Cool. Uh, all right. So um, I want to talk to you guys about the um, the journey that we had uh, going from a sort of self service uh, uh, vault outside of Kubernetes to a self service vault running in Kubernetes and sort of like this stops in between. Um, uh, Use my attempt at humor, at millennial humor, I should say. It's an uh, it sucks to manage vault starter pack. Um, so you see Jira tickets that says that say um, urgent, my secrets are gone. Like all right, I'm, I'm not sure what to do. Uh, then somebody doesn't even know what vault is. What's vault? LOL. Um, people putting like this is almost an exact screenshot of something that somebody did. Exactly that they put a git token. Um, on the on a Kubernetes manifest, so these people do that um, when 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 they are allowed to, or when they can do that. Uh, people don't want to write configuration; they just want to write code. Um, or if it's configuration, we want to minimize it. There's something that they already know, but it's something that's like very concrete, very specific. Um, Rumbuck just says, "Ask SRE." I don't even know what this vault thing is, and I just like I need a secret. I need a password. My database can't connect, but I don't know what to do. All right. Um, in our case specifically, like we have, or we used to have all of our uh, vault configuration in Terraform, but because of the deployment model that we had, or that we still have just multiple Kubernetes clusters and multiple Terraform clusters, we had to run Terraform apply multiple times, do uh, authentication in each. So it was like a, a very um, uh, great pain, right? So this is kind of a, all right, in that uh, attempted humor over, this is more, more serious stuff, more adult stuff. Um, so this is kind of where we were. Right, so this is a, kind of like a watered down version of, of, the, uh, of the deployment and imagine multiple uh, copies of this uh, for our, our multiple Kubernetes clusters. So uh, on the right, we have the uh, like just ser a regular service pod, a, a pod for a given microservice that might be, uh, might've been launched with a deployment, stateful set, daemon set, whatever. Um, and then a service account associated with it. The uh, service will integrate with Vault directly using its service account identity and authenticating with uh, the Kubernetes, uh, yeah, the Kubernetes auth method, and fetch the secrets. So on the left, we have obviously that's Vault. Uh, I'm skipping the uh, the uh, storage back in here, but we, we're using uh, console as recommended. But that's less important right now. So um, on the left hand, outside of the VPC, and it's not even computer at all, we have uh, the Vault configuration both the configuration of the this in Terraform, and I try to do the Terraform color, by the way. Um, but uh, so it's the configuration or the Terraform code for the cluster itself. So uh, Terraform resources for EC2 instances, load balancers, security groups, et cetera, as well as the configuration for the vault uh, control plane um, uh, as well. Uh, and then we have the static secrets uh, in Terraform as well. Before anybody, um, says anything, these are not, these were encrypted secrets that were stored in source control. So it was not like that other thing that I mentioned earlier. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. So uh, you notice here that I, I put a, a dotted line around a vault and the configuration portion of it, because that's what's, um, or the, what was owned by the S3 team. So the, the problem here is that there was a disconnect between what the services uh, owned and, and could manage and could control and what the, uh, um, the S3 team was uh, the owner of. So um, this kind of led to an illusion of self-service. So that's why it's, it's quoted there. And that uh, we reduced it so that if you wanted to add a new service to be integrated with Vault, all you had to do literally is just add this one line in this locals.tf file. And we had everything on, um, on module so that we, when we ran, uh, everything would be configured just for your new service. We'd create a new Vault role, a new Vault policy that would uh, isolate secrets to just your service and um, you wouldn't have to do anything else. Um, and again, solve service, and this, this is what I mentioned earlier, the, the, even the content of the static secrets was in code. So this is a KMS encrypted um, string. So this is not the actual secret. Uh, so we would uh, encrypt secrets offline and then copy them here. Be, like service owners could do that, just copy this Terraform, put it there. Um, it would not store the secret or the, the actual uh, plain text secret anywhere because we're using the in-memory backend, um, uh, a Terraform backend, which by the way is one of the uh, best non-documented feature or sub uh, uh, under-documented features of Terraform. So uh, everything, the, the other the, uh, nice side effect of this is that um, it would be an atomic apply. Every time we applied secrets, it would be exactly that. It's just that and would override anything that anybody might have uh, modified out of band. 
but again, this is self-service because um, I mean, the people could uh, make the changes and create the PRs, but after this, the, the, the friction was in that they had to chase uh, people, try to get the PRs ma uh, merged or at least approved and then the secrets or the configuration applied. So this was like very uh, um, manual handoff, like human interaction thing that was not automated at all. Uh, now the human interactions are bad, but I'm saying that they're, they're, they're frictionful. So um, that's why it was only the illusion of self-service. So um, kind of expanding on that, PRs are not self-service because service owners could add their own configuration and their own uh, 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 secrets or the static secrets. But then vault owners, which is uh, was Esri uh, in our case, uh, we were the only ones that had the the uh, permissions to actually approve or not approve, but to apply the changes to talk to the vault control plane or or to uh, decrypt the secrets. So uh, that's where the the limits of the self service was. Um, the other thing about having everything in Terraform, as much as I love Terraform, but the problem with configuration that changed very frequently is that um, Terraform is a, a point in time configuration. Kind of system uh, even if you have some, like an automated pipeline it's GitOps and every commit every merge to master everything gets applied that configuration is only guaranteed to be correct at the moment that it's applied it's uh nothing at least in, in our infrastructure nothing was stopping other people from modify or even service owners or, or admins from modifying things out of band that would be uh overridden after vault is um is uh after terraform is run um, and there, because we also had the secrets uh, in S configuration, there was additional potential drift in the secrets themselves. So um, there's uh, there's like sort of two lines that that could um, diverge. All right. So before moving further further, let me introduce myself. Uh, you know, I'm Pater Vizu. Uh, I work. Well, I'm a lead SRE engineer here at here at um, uh, the ASAP uh, office. We're in the World Trade Center, the 80th floor. Uh, I think we mentioned that earlier. Um, so the, uh, company, I'm not, not going to go too deep on what the company does, but we do customer interaction systems, um, uh, with a focus with, uh, on AI and by AI is less artificial intelligence. Cause that's kind of like a blurry uh, term and more augmented intelligence. We work on try to make, not replace humans with bots cause that's impossible to do, or whoever does it is going to become a millionaire, but, um, augment humans and have them give them better, um, um, uh, cognitive abilities. Uh, and um, kind of implied from what uh, Katie said earlier, but I'm the unofficial HashiCorp ambassador. Uh, very often people just like roll their eyes at me when I say that the solution of any problem, it's one of the six tools, uh, um, HashiCorp. So um, whatever, I roll my eyes back. Okay, so um, talk about a little bit about Vault or the process of, around Vault. Uh, we're kind of moving into Kubernetes territory. Uh, I know maybe not everybody is uh, familiar with Kubernetes, so I want to talk about a couple of uh, concepts that are um, uh, related to the to the uh, solution that I've, we ended up with. <clears throat> so the Kubernetes operator pattern, it's essentially um, it's implementing a controller that's running on a loop that's reconciling uh, the uh, express state or desired state and actual state. So um, it's not limited to just the Kubernetes API or the Kubernetes um, um, objects themselves. Uh, actually, the point of the operator pattern is that it's a combination of a controller and a what Kubernetes calls a custom resource. What a custom resource is, it's something that's not a native or a, a, a Kubernetes primitive, but that you define a, um, a spec uh, yourself or a schema yourself uh, with however uh, many fields or compositions of fields that, that you want, and then your operator will act on those things. Um, uh, and when I say that it's not limited to Kubernetes API, I mean that the, the code that it's running, the controller code that it's running can talk to the Kubernetes API and other APIs or even external systems. For example, something can, you can have a controller that creates S3 buckets, um, assuming that it can authenticate, of course, but, uh, uh, or you can also have a, it can also be a controller that creates uh, additional pods or deployments or services or whatever. Um, it minimizes drift by continuously ensuring that whatever you're stating, uh, whatever your, your definition is in your YAML file or in your um, uh, uh, Kubernetes manifest is what is uh, what the actual uh, real state of the thing is. This is in contrast to what I was saying earlier. 
in Terraform, when you apply something, it gets created, it gets applied, and everything is in a perfect sync. But somebody could just make changes, or maybe some other automation can make uh, changes a minute after that, and they're going to be going to get overridden. Whereas with a Kubernetes uh, operator, things are continuously applied and continuously uh, um, in sync. That's one Kubernetes concept. The other one is the Kubernetes admission controllers. They're kind of similar um, in that they also interact with the Kubernetes API, but in this case, these are webhooks that run once for every CRUD request to the Kubernetes API. So every time either a human or a service or some automation uh, does a, uh, any CRUD operation, uh, Kubernetes will first intercept that request and then run it through the, a list of admission controllers or, or, or admission webhooks and take some action on it. So there's, there's uh, two kinds of um, webhooks. One is the validating webhooks that can reject uh, requests based on certain uh, predefined rules or webhooks that can take that object or that request and then modify it by injecting additional fields or, or um, mutating things. They're called uh, mutating webhooks. So these both get uh, invoked before the object is even stored in the etcd or whatever the uh, storage backend is. Uh, and they're used for enforcing restrictions, like you know you can't create a certain object that doesn't meet certain uh, um, requirements, but, uh, like naming requirements or resource limits or whatever, or for you know injecting things like sidecars or automatic injection of um, environment variables or things like that. Uh, and I know this is kind of boring. We're getting to the meaty part, so just bear with me. Okay, this is kind of the, where the fun starts. So um, we, we we got to a point where it's like, all right, this is causing too much pain. The the, the company is growing both in like business volume, but also in terms of uh, in numbers of uh, teams and engineers. There's more microservices every day because obviously everybody wants to do microservices. I'm not against them, but like that is the thing to do. Um, so every new microservice I wanted to. Um, integrated with Vault, had to go through the whole thing. Uh, so if somebody hasn't been with the company for long enough, they don't know. So there's a, um, there's a lot of friction with the S3 team that's taking a lot of time in our day. So we wanted to automate as much as we could, um, ideally everything. Uh, so spoiler, we did get there. So, but let me walk you through the journey. So based on, we want to base it on custom resources, meaning like uh, the leverage the um, operator pattern that I mentioned earlier. Um, so you can define things with a certain schema uh, in Kubernetes uh, uh, relative to a Kubernetes uh, resource, custom resource schema, uh, so and not be bound by what the like HCL schema uh, or uh, a certain provider resources uh, limited to. Um, so also wanted to, to make it annotation driven so that people don't have to like write as much config configuration as possible. They just signal their intention based on annotations. It goes back to the, the thing I mentioned earlier about people not wanting to write configuration. Uh, so this is literally the, the minimum amount without having literally almost, literally everything um, done for you. Just like add one annotation and one value that indicates the intention that, that you want things to be configured. That's it. Um, and you got it to be 100% SRE free, at least in the, in the, the um, not in the, operation and management of Vault itself, but in the configuration of it. All right, so more uh, pretty drawings because uh, uh, hearing me talk is not, is not that fun. So again, uh, we have now the, the Kubernetes boxes, you, you can see is uh, larger because we like put everything in, um, in Kubernetes now. So this looks pretty much the same as it was before, except like Vault is uh, within Kubernetes. You have your, your pods or your uh, workloads and your service accounts. Um, now the difference is that Vault is now being created by a Vault operator. So uh, instead of us handcrafting all the uh, Kubernetes manifests or creating the Vault and Vault uh, service accounts and services and everything, uh, we just define one Vault object and then the operator creates a Vault cluster based on, on the specs there. And there's more detail in a minute. So then we also have a, uh, what we call a Vault dynamic configuration operator. Um, it's kind of a mouthful. mouthful. We didn't want to name it something cute. We didn't want to go with a nautical theme or a K theme or a Greek theme. So it's just like, that's, that's what it is. Uh, so what it does is that it discovers service accounts and annotations on them. And um, it reconfigures Vault so that those service or services, uh, sorry, workloads that are using those service accounts can authenticate um, to Vault using that identity. 
Um, we we'll also leverage want to leverage the mutating webhooks for do some uh, automatic injection of things and automatic configuration, so people don't have to think about what goes where and what needs to be mounted or etc. Uh, and then also the um, so similar to what we have with the uh, uh, KMS encrypted secrets that would have to be applied by by an, like an actual human operator. Now this the same version but with an automated operator that's um, picking up secret uh, um, custom resources. So the first part I mentioned earlier, uh, it's a vault operator discovering vault CRD object or custom resource object with a certain definition that that's what launches uh, the, uh, the vault cluster. We're using a third party uh, or an open source uh, vault cluster, uh, vault operator called Bank Vaults. Uh, this open source by a company called Banzai Cloud. Um, I hadn't heard of them uh, up until I guess last year. They do a bunch of automation things, uh, 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 pretty cool. They, they have a lot of vault related um, um, open source projects or open source tools. They also have a webhook and a couple other things. So that was, that made life pretty easy, at least in terms of uh, launching Vault, because it's also YAML, it's Helm friendly, customized friendly, uh, any kind of templating that, that you want to use. Uh, they have a Helm chart available. So you can, if you're deploying with Helm, you can just add the values. The, the defaults work for the most part. You want to uh, customize, add values, add other backends, whatever, um, like that's available as well. Um, this is kind of minor in the context of this, but it's, it's important that uh, if you're familiar with uh, core OS's operator lifecycle management framework, this, this thing is compatible and can be deployed um, via the, the OLM. Uh, it's kind of a framework for um, trying to allow operators to deploy, op human operators to deploy automated operators the same way, or at least in a consistent way, similar to how you deploy actual um, applications. The other, the next, uh, this is kind of one of the stars of the show here, uh, the, the vault dynamic configuration operator. Uh, the, the, the important thing here is that this thing is not actually talking to vault. That is modifying the vault CRD or the custom resource object on the fly based on the service accounts that it discovers that are configured with a certain annotation. And then it lets the vault operator reconfigure vault on the fly based on, on, that, on those modifications. So the vault dynamic oper configuration operator doesn't talk to vault at all. It talks to the vault object. So it's, it's actually modifying the source of truth. Um, I know I said that this is one of the stars of the show and it's not really just because I wrote the open source um, um, operator for this, but I did. So uh, again, it's an operator that um, uh, modifies the vault configuration based on annotations um, so that the uh, anything that that any service account that gets annotated with a, a, a certain predefined um, annotation will get a, a vault a role, a prefix, a sort of preset policy, um, and will enable authentication for that for that uh, role. So that it's it's very useful in our case, where we want to standardize everything that everything has a certain uh, policy, and only has access to uh, secrets secrets for that specific. Uh, application named after this specific uh, service account. Um, and then again, like I said, the operator doesn't modify the vault itself, but the, but the custom resource. And because of that, one of the benefits is that it doesn't need authentication, uh, authenticate itself to vault because it's just modifying the, the, the uh, object itself. Um, you, can, you can modify the, the permissions on the operations on that object um, in Kubernetes roles, but that, that uh, kind of removes a sort of like chicken and egg problem with you need to authenticate yourself to modify something involved and it's kind of a circular dependency. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, let me just check time real quick. Uh, all right, so this is kind of what it looks like. You add uh, an annotation before this change, like the, only the first four lines were necessary, the version, the kind and the name. Now you add that annotation and like things happen behind the scenes for you. And the, the important part here is that service owners can do this themselves. They don't have to open tickets, chase people, approve, uh, merge, whatever. Um, so again, a little bit of a, a seamless, uh, shameless self-plug is that I also wrote this operator. <laughs> um, so the thing is like this discovers the, the custom resource, uh, the secret objects, decrypts the secrets on the fly. Uh, well, you have to uh, encrypt the secret offline with KMS. Um, I think I forgot to mention that we were 100% on AWS, so a lot of these things, a lot of these things, or at least a few things, are AWS specific, more explicitly KMS. 
So we encrypt offline with KMS, then the operator has an IAM role that allows it to decrypt that, it gets decrypted in memory, um, gets the secrets get, get deployed as a custom resource as opposed to uh, when they were uh, expressed as uh, Terraform resources. So the, the operator discovers the custom resources, decrypts on the fly and injects into vault. And um, that way the, the secrets never exist in plain text outside of in memory because when they're encrypted or when they're uh, uh, decrypted in memory, uh, sorry, decrypted by the operator or transmitted via TLS, assuming you're doing that over HTTPS, then plain text is never um, outside of memory. This is kind of what it looks like. It's similar to what I showed earlier, but this is a Kubernetes object. You have your, your kind, the name, the path where you want to inject. Um, you indicate that you want to do uh, KV version one, which is our case, but the, uh, the operator also supports uh, KV ver uh, version two. And these are my secrets. Those are going to be the, the, the fields on the secret that I inject. And that's an encrypted secret. Um, the operator also supports uh, encryption context if you want to encrypt things with more uh, granularity. So um, that's supported as well. Uh, kind of lastly, the, uh, the, um, the mutating webhooks, the, the, the part that, that we're doing there is uh, we're using two mutating webhooks. One is, uh, again, sorry, I wrote this one. Uh, but I have to admit that uh, the Vault Kates um, uh, webhook or project kind of overshadows that because I started writing it before that was a thing. Uh, so now we're kind of kind of tied to this. But it's the other cool thing that the um, Vault Kates uh, webhook or project has is that you can do automatic uh, secret injection to the pod so that applications don't have to authenticate or do the whole um, Vault uh, authentication dance. Uh, but, but it does. So um, automatically injects a uh, sidecar, uh, Vault agent sidecar, so that applications can talk to the local sidecar instead of having to authenticate to the remote Vault. Uh, so like discovery is easier. And then there's other benefits, like the application never sees a Vault token. It only sees its own secrets. So um, that's kind of, um, kind of what it does. And then there's another one more sort of like ASAP specific private one for injecting certain environment variables for discovery and for sort of some um, kind of consistency. Um, that's it's not open source because it's more, uh, uh, it's very ASAP specific. So we want to make these two specific, the, the, the webhooks make, I uh, want to make them optional and annotation based. Optional because sidecars are controversial. I don't know why people are very against sidecars and there's a bunch of memes or whatever and I get it, but like, I, there's, there's benefits. So, be, but because they're controversial, we, we didn't want to force them into people. So, uh, we, we add them as uh, optional if you add the annotation. So that way the services can choose to own their vault configuration or just hand it off to webhooks. And it's like, I, I, I add my annotation and I trust that that's gonna happen behind the scenes for me and I don't have to put anything in source control. Um, and by the way, like a little bit of shout out to the, the Kube webhook um, framework. Cause like that's, uh, if you're writing webhooks for uh, Kubernetes, especially in Go, that's a great starting point. It sort of creates things for you and just need to, um, uh, implement one function. This is kind of uh, what it, what it uh, does. I uh, think I'm, I have a few minutes. So um, if you add that uh, annotation, by the way, the, the auto inject webhook, you can either inject it as a sidecar, that is it's a long lived sidecar that listens on a local port and then your application can talk to it on localhost or can inject as an init container that will authenticate fetch a, a vault token, drop it in a, in a known location and then the main container can use that to authenticate. So uh, when you add that annotation, this, uh, even if you just have your container, your my service container there, then the webhook will, uh, when the pod gets created, it will automatically create the vault agent with the right version that you specify and the configuration and mounts and whatnot. Um, um, this is like, I'm, I had this in code, like I did a copy paste cause like just to be consistent, but you don't, this is not something you need to add to your, to your uh, manifest. It gets uh, created by the webhook. Uh, similar to that, the, um, the default configuration webhook, you indicate what specific container you want to add uh, your uh, uh, configuration to, and you just have to name the uh, the the uh, environment variables that you want to uh, want to um, get injected, and then the the webhook is going to actually inject the right value. So people don't need to memorize like where's the path for vaults or the CA cert or where's the, uh, the address for vaults. Just name them there. That's all you need to uh, um, ensure that you're going to be uh, integrating with vaults. So one of the benefits is that now that Vault is in um, Kubernetes, 
do we get integrated with the rest of the uh, of the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem? I'm gonna a little bit jump through some of these, but one of the ones that is uh, I'm a big fan of the Open Policy Agent project. If you haven't uh, um, heard about it, heard about it is a CNCF uh, project that it's essentially just a policy engine. You can define policies and rules and like a, a few lines of code. It's, it takes a little bit to uh, wrap your mind around it, but once you discover the, the potential of it, it's great for enforcing rules. We're using it for enforcing encryption context and allow, uh, uh, preventing people to prevent people from shooting themselves in the foot by applying secrets in the wrong environment. Um, you know, you can integrate with Prometheus for monitoring, alerting. Um, you can do Falco for runtime security, not just on your applications, but on the vault operators and vault itself. <clears throat> Uh, you can use it as a CA for console connect for Istio for whatever it is you have. If you're on your storage back on Kubernetes, you can have uh, your you can provision storage with Rook, Open, EBS, Longhorn, all TNCF projects. Uh, I know that's it. Uh, I hurried a little bit through the thing. I hope I didn't skip uh, a lot I'm around if you want to ask questions. Um, we are hiring. Uh, we are hiring for remote people as well. We're based in New York City. We have offices in San Francisco, Mountain View, Buenos Aires. Um, and but we're also open to uh, uh, to remote remote work. My team specifically, the SRE team, we are hiring aggressively. But there's back end, front end, uh, and a bunch of positions you can find there. Um, thank you very much. That's uh, that's how you can uh, get a hold of me. That's uh, it's not a real website. You just redirect to my GitHub profile. But you can get a hold of me on Twitter as well. Uh, all right, uh, that's it. Thank you. Cool. So I did it almost on time. Uh, Katie, I don't know if there's time for, time for questions, but I know that Ali's, uh, okay. Ali says we have a, a little bit of time. Um, is, is that because you're not ready or because, ready. okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, no, I think we have good questions here, right? Cool. Yeah, so, we have time for a quick question. We do have time? Yeah, go ahead with one. We don't have questions here. I don't know if anybody online has. Okay. I'm not seeing any in Zoom. Let me check YouTube and see if I see any there. Let's see. I'm also not seeing any on YouTube, but I do encourage you to hang out in case someone wants to type some. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll join the, the YouTube um, chat. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to take my presenter's hat off and then the, the MC's uh, hat back on. Let me stop sharing. Uh -huh.